Great. So we'll talk about strong duality today, which essentially means there is no duality gap. Okay, so weak duality says Q star is less than or equal to F star. And in strong duality, we will basically talk about convex objective functions, convex constraints, under which there is no duality gap. And so, uh, so uh, Q star will always be equal to F star. So I'll give you three examples. The first example is the linear program C transpose X such that ax equal to b, cx equal to d, x is in rn. In all these cases, I'm going to freely assume that optimal solution exists, everything is fine. Um, the, there is a feasible point, so it shouldn't be that these, there is, oh, cx less than equal to b. So all these uh, equalities and inequalities would be satisfied by at least one point in the set rn. Okay, so that way F star would be finite. So this is example 1A, example 1B, I want to minimize half X transpose QX plus B transpose X such that AX equal to B, CX less than equal to D, and X is in Rn. Second example is I want to minimize fx such that djx is less than equal to zero for all j in one to r x is in set x. <coughs> okay. I'm going to assume here that X is convex set, F, G, J are convex functions, and third condition is known as Slater constraint. qualification, so we are going to make this assumption which basically says that there exists X bar in capital X such that GJ X bar is less than zero for all J in one through R. Okay, and here also, oh.
Okay, so these are the three, uh, I mean there are many cases where there is no duality gap, but these are the three well-known cases where there is no duality gap. In all these cases, we should implicitly assume that these are all feasible problems um, and the optimal solution exists and is finite. The optimal value is finite. Okay, so in those situations, uh, this is optimization problem, this is also a convex optimization problem, this is also a convex optimization problem. And in all these three cases, one can show that there is no duality gap. Uh, we will only prove this, uh, this theorem, which is under these conditions there is no duality gap, uh, but the proofs of other results have similar flavor, okay? So there's no point doing the proofs for one and three because they have similar flavor. Uh, two is, uh, and, and, and the proof of two is somewhat involved, so it's going to take uh, quite a bit of time to actually prove this result, that there's no duality gap under these conditions. Why is the uh, Slater constraint qualification necessary? Because it's essentially saying that we have <coughs> one point that is non-trivial. Right, right. But so we will see where it's needed. Okay, um, so we'll see why Slater constraint qualification is necessary in order for no duality gap to exist. Uh, I do want to give an example, uh, example for two. So I want to minimize x such that x squared is less than or equal to zero, x is an R, so there is no point x bar such that the inequality is strict, right? Because x bar, uh, yeah, so x bar square can never be negative for x bar in R. So Slater constraint qualification does not hold for this example. So uh, so Slater constraint qualification does not hold and we have seen in the last class that there is no geometric multiplier and there is duality gap. Okay, we showed this in the previous class. We have studied this example before. Okay, so Slater constraint qualification is important. Okay, you could have examples where uh, there is a duality gap because this Slater constraint qualification does not hold. Okay, is the roadmap clear for this class? The proof of two, that's, the, that's what we are going to do in this class. And if we have time, then we'll go to, we'll, we'll talk about branch and bound method. <clears throat> yes? So we're trying to show what strong duality is? Is that what we're trying to do right now? No, so strong duality is defined where there is no duality gap. Okay. So Q star is equal to F star. So remember in the previous class, we had a bunch of examples where Q star was strictly less than F star. Right. And under some conditions, Q star is equal to F star. So here we are going to study cases where there is no duality gap, which means the strong duality holds, okay? okay. So the defin there's no, de well, the definition of strong duality is that there is no gap, right. okay? So it's, it has strong duality. And so these are the cases 
an assumption under which strong duality holds. So before we would start on analyzing any of these problems, we'd want to make sure that the Slater constraint qualification and held. Is that something that winds up being an issue for problems we consider with this? Because you could construct uh, uh, inequalities for that that would make it extremely complicated to verify that there was a point. Yes. Is that a problem we run into, or is it something that doesn't tend to come up with problems considered for this? You know, I have never worked on a problem where I have to show strong duality. So I don't know whether this is a very, uh, very difficult constraint to show. Uh, but someone who has worked on inequality constraint problem, can you think and come up with an example where Slater constraint qualification may not hold? I know some of you are working on some problems on optimization in your research. So have you ever encountered a case where there is no point such that these inequalities would be strict. OK, so it seems that it's not a problem. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I don't know whether this is a problem or not. OK, it, uh, it's a good question. So let us construct the set S, or this uh, part two. So this is my GX, this is my FX, and my set it looks something like this. This is my set S. Okay, And what we want to show is I can construct a hyperplane. So in this case, the hyperplane would look something like this. So I can construct a hyperplane such that the entire set S is going to be the positive half space. Okay. So now the thing is, the problem is there is a, so if you want to construct a hyperplane in any dimensional space, one of the first ideas that strikes anyone's mind is to use supporting hyperplane theorem, okay? And the supporting hyperplane and separating hyperplane theorem, these are two important theorems in convex. Uh, so hyperplane theorem. So supporting hyperplane theorem says if you have a convex set with non-empty interior, you can construct a hyperplane so that the whole set is in the positive half space. Okay, and uh, this is this is supporting. Hyperplane theorem. Okay, so I have a convex set. Let me call it A. And I can, and it has a non empty interior, so I can construct a hyperplane such that the entire set SA is in the positive half space. Um, I can also draw the hyperplane that is touching the set A. So I can draw a hyperplane like this, which is touching the set A, and A is completely in the positive half space of this particular hyperplane. So if you want to construct a hyperplane of this type, um, we want to use something like this, something like a supporting hyperplane theorem, which says that I can draw a hyperplane so that some set is in the positive half space. But the problem is supporting hyperplane theorem requires the set A to be convex. And we see that the set S here is not convex. Okay, so that's really the key challenge for this particular problem. So how should we go about proving that? result. Okay, is the problem clear? Is the issue clear? The issue is supporting hyperplane theorem allows us to construct a hyperplane so that the set S or a set is in the positive ha half space. But in this situation, my set is non-convex, so I can't construct the hyperplane on this particular set. So how do we? Would we have something 
and like we have the point of interest, which is the uh, point where the hyperplane is supposed to intersect with set S. And, mm -hmm. and, and could we say something about uh, convexi convexivity around uh, that point of interest, where there, if we have some sort of around of delta? No, no. So we cannot do that. So his idea is locally. I can construct a convex set around this point, which is the optimal point. So here, gx is less than or equal to 0, and f is minimized. So can I say that the curvature here is somewhat positive, so it's almost convex here, so I can construct a hyperplane, and so on. The problem with this idea is that, remember that when we were discussing about this hyperplane, we said that the entire set s has to be in the, in the positive half plane. OK? So yes, so we somehow need to make sure that the entire set S has to be in on one side of this hyperplane. Any other idea? So this local idea, creating a convex set locally around F star doesn't seem to be working. Any other thoughts? I'll let other people come up with some other thoughts. OK? You want to make a circle around the set, but then, but then you remember that the let's say I want to construct a circle around this set. Then the hyperplane is supposed to touch. Hyperplane is supposed to be like this, but now your hyperplane would probably be something like this. Right, so there is a problem with that. Okay, there is another hand in the back. So, so supporting hyperplane theorem says I have a convex set with non-empty interior. I can draw a hyperplane which is touching the set, and then that set is in the positive half. The problem here is that this. So I want to construct a hyperplane here. Remember that the duality gap has something to do with the hyperplane, and where does it intersect this particular axis? Okay, so. Uh, I think this is an important point, so I want you to understand. So I'm going to erase the supporting hyperplane part, and I want to contrast this example. I want to contrast this example with the other example where we showed that there is a duality gap, something like this, uh, where the only hyperplane you could draw was looked like this, but the optimal solution is here. This is your S star, and this is your Q star. Right? So we want to draw a hyperplane so that the entire set S is in a positive half state. But this set is non convex okay? So we need to somehow draw this hyperplane, and I'm looking for ideas as to what to do to this set in order to be able to draw a hyperplane. Um, using the supporting hyperplane, so there is no duality gap. Okay, it's a long question. Oh, F star would be this. So this point is F star, right? So this is this is my optimal point, where G X is less than or equal to zero and F is minimized. So F star is this point. Okay, so the hyperplane has to go through this point, and it has to go through this point. Only then there is no duality there. And then that set S has to be in the positive half state. You have a qu clarifying question, or you have an idea? OK, so I have to go to him first. No, we don't. Uh, it could be unbounded, not on this side, but on that side, yes, it can be unbounded. We don't really have to show anything about S, okay? Because we don't quite know what S looks like. We know that it could be non-common. Okay, there's no way to prove one this Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the idea. So 
Matthew's idea is we embed this set S into another set which is convex which doesn't affect this region of interest. Okay. So it could have it could have weird behavior here, I don't care. As long as it doesn't affect the region of interest. And what we do is we embed this set S into that particular convex set and then I can use supporting hyperplane theorem to prove the existence of such a hyperplane. Okay. Uh, okay, so what should Okay, I, I guess uh, let's move ahead with the proof, but that's exactly what the proof is. Yes. You said a moment ago that we don't know anything about S. Yes. So if we don't know anything about S, then how are we ever to come up with some S hat that matches the same behavior? We'll see about we'll see it needs a proof. It's not obvious. It needs a proof. And sure the first person who might have thought about it might have really looked into this problem for several months in order to come up with this particular set. Okay, that's an important point. Uh, okay. So I'm going to define my set A as Z comma W in R R cross R such that gx is less than or equal to g, fx is less than or equal to w, and x is in capital X. So I define a set A, points in this space, such that there is a point x, such that gx is less than or equal to z, and there is a point, uh, and, and fx is less than or equal to w. Okay, and what that set looks like for this particular problem, it's going to look like this is my set A. Is that clear? So my entire set S is actually contained in the set A by definition because uh, we are keeping track of all the possible x as that gx is. So you can take z to be equal to gx and w to be equal to fx. And so the set S will be contained in the set A. And it doesn't seem to the nature of set here at the lowest point. It certainly changes everything up above this particular point because as you can see uh, the set A uh, strictly contains set S in this region. Okay, So there are these points in set A that's not part of set S. Okay, But in this region, if you zoom into this region nothing changes about uh, the nature of the set S. So this is the region of interest and there's no change here. So is that akin to you know, doing some sort of translation that would make a a being the a uh, a pot, all positive uh, quadrant with the point of interest touching the the, um, the x equals zero line. I'm sorry, y equals zero line. Uh, you know, I have a problem with your positive quadrant part. Uh, it may not be the case. So 
if my set S looks something like this, then my set A is going to look like this. Okay. Okay. So it's not really a quadrant. It looks like a quadrant here, but not really a quadrant here. Go here. It will go like this. Um, yeah. So, anyway, so this this is what the set A would look like if the set S uh, was if the set S looked something like this. Okay. So there are many uh, claims that one needs to prove in order to prove there is no duality gap here. So claim one is, yes? Sorry, one quick question. Um, the, uh, the boundaries that you, the boundaries bottom, for example, um, is that necessary? That is, first of all, that's um, W, that's isn't it? F of x less than equal to W. F of x is less than equal to sub W. So this is the this coordinate is z, and this coordinate is w. So if I pick a point z, comma w, there is a point here in this particular set S where fx is less than or equal to w, and gx is less than or equal to z. Okay. So remember, if as you move in this direction, the value of gx increases. Okay. So. So yeah. So so this point, at this particular point, you have gx less than or equal to z because it's on this side of z and your fx is less than or equal to w because you are below w and you are within the set s this point is within the set s was there any other question no x Convex F G J convex implies A is convex. Okay, and the proof is simple, and I leave it as an exercise. Uh, go back home, the good student in you will wake up. <laughs> Would the slightly lazier student be able to find it in the textbook? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's just a lot of equations and dealing with convexity, which all of you are comfortable with. So what's claim two? Claim two is zero comma F star is at the boundary of A. Okay, so this is my zero comma f star point. So the x coordinate, well, not x, but the horizontal coordinate is zero, the vertical coordinate is f star. Okay, so certainly in the picture, it does look like zero comma f star is at the boundary of the set A. Well, let uh, well, well, we'll prove it in a bit. Uh, let me write down all the claims, and then we'll prove it there. Claim three is I'm going to use supporting hyperplane theorem to show that there exist mutual mu tilde and beta tilde not equal to 0, 0, such that mu tilde multiplied by 0 plus beta tilde f star is less than or equal to mu 
mu tilde transpose z plus beta tilde multiplied by w for all z w in A. Uh, zero, zero. This is uh, how do I write zero? Uh, I'll just write it <laughs> zero. Okay, so this is zero. Not Oh, wait a second, this one. So what does claim 3 say? 3 says that, look, this point is at the boundary, and it's a convex set. So I can draw a support using supporting hyperplane theorem. I can actually draw a hyperplane such that it touches 0 f star. And the entire set A is in the positive half space. Okay, and this is exactly what the inequality is. So this my mu tilde beta tilde zero f star is less than or equal to mu tilde beta tilde z w. Okay, and this is what this is saying is A is in the positive half space of this particular line, this particular hyperplane. And what does the hyperplane look like? Actually, it's just this hyperplane. Uh, let me draw it. This is the hyperplane. Yes. Uh, does the gain to PCP say that the minimum and the minimum for F is achieved in the G is smaller than zero uh, and not? So, the minimum is achieved at this particular point. Okay. So, your hyperplane is actually going to look like this. Okay. So, this A, this set A is, is a convex set and you can pick this point which is 0 f star point and you can draw a hyperplane here. So there is no, um, there is nothing here that says, uh, so, so far we have actually not used the fact that gx has to be strictly less than 0 for some point. Okay, we'll use it in the next, next result. So, where do I write claim 4? I have to erase. Actually, I'm just going to erase. I want all the claims to be on this side of the board. So claim four is that mu tilde is greater than or equal to zero beta tilde is greater than or equal to 0. So that's part 1 of the claim. And then if there exists x bar such that dj x bar is strictly less than 0, then uh, beta tilde is strictly positive. Yes? Okay, so oh, those are disjoint statements, mu and beta have to be greater than zero. And then yes, and then you have this additional constraint under which beta tilde is strictly positive. And is that uh, if and only if, or is it just an if statement? It's just an if statement. Okay. Okay. So remember that here we want the mu to be greater than or equal to zero, right? That's part of the uh, geometric, the definition of geometric multiplier. 
so we need to show that this hyperplane is not just any hyperplane. It has to have mu tilde and beta tilde both uh, non-negative. Yes? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, you just explained it. Don't OK. I can read your brains. <laughs> What's going on in your mind? It looked like you were going towards um, that there has to be some S star with this statement, but I don't know if that's what you're trying to say. Uh, no, so far I haven't used the fact that there is F star. I think F star, the fact that F star exists and is bounded is kind of used here. Okay. Okay. This is claim four. And then we have claim five. Claim five, I'm going to define mu equals mu tilde over beta tilde. And then I'm going to show that F star is less than or equal to inf over x in x, L of x comma mu, which is, of course, less than or equal to, is equal to Q of mu which is less than or equal to Q star. OK? And which further implies that there is no duality gap. Yes? If you already know F star, isn't there just a, some kind of a recursive function? Or whichever, whichever S is. So if you knew, uh, you know, supporting hyperplane requires you to know the entire set A, right? Because if you don't know, so just knowing a point doesn't really help. Kind of recursively draw lines and see which one. Just like our means. Really you know, I haven't, I haven't uh, studied any algorithm for finding supporting hyperplane. It's, it's, it's an existence result. It holds very generally. But I'm sure there may be some algorithms which tries to find supporting hyperplane given a convex set of some sort. I just haven't uh, learned about it so far. OK? So all of you are, all of you are fine with this step. So your f star is less than or equal to q star. Remember, weak duality set Q star is less than or equal to F star. So that can only happen if F star was equal to Q star, and therefore there is no duality gap. OK? That's what claim 5 is. So let's go ahead with the proof. Any questions so far? On claim one to five, yes. Yeah. Why did you say F star is less than equal to um, infinite? From here. Oh, the other one. F star so this this result, this part will come from here. We will go through the proof of claim five where this comes from, but this result comes from this statement. Two. So how do we prove that? this point 0 f star is at the boundary of a okay so let's consider a point which is 0 and f star minus epsilon okay so let so assume uh, so this is proved by contradiction so assume 0 comma f star minus epsilon belongs to a this implies there exists x such that fx is less than or equal to f star minus epsilon and gx is less than or equal to 0. Not possible. Contradiction. This implies 0 f star is on the boundary. Showing that zero f star minus epsilon is not an A doesn't mean that it's not on the boundary of A. So, so A is a closed set, right? Right. Yeah. 
So it has to be either at the boundary or interior. Okay. So A is a closed set, so I pick a point that we think is in the neighborhood of 0 comma F star. And then I show that if that point is part of A, then, Z, then F star is not an optimal solution because I can find an X as that Fx is less than or equal to F star minus epsilon, and Gx is less than or equal to zero, which means that X is feasible. Remember the optimization problem was Gx less than or equal to zero, and X lies in the set X. So this is a contradiction with respect to the optimality of the uh, F star. Okay, F star is supposed to be the minimum value of the um, that satisfies all the constraint. Okay, so that's proof two. Proof? Yes. Z G X equal to zero or less? Less than equal to zero. So the question of the set A was Z comma W such that gx less than or equal to z, fx less than or equal to w, x is in the set x. So the, the point we come up with is 0 fx, f star minus f. Yes, so gx is less, so this is my z, this is my w, so gx less than or equal to z, and fx less than or equal to w. Okay. Okay, any other question? Great, so I'm going to erase this. So proof of three. So I have a convex set A. I have a point uh, zero F star at the boundary of A. So I can use supporting hyperplane theorem to get a value of mu tilde B tilde that passes through zero F star So I can construct a hyperplane that passes through zero comma F star and A is in the positive half space. Okay? And this what the, the equation for the hyperplane is going to look like. So the hyperplane is mu tilde z plus uh, mu tilde transpose z plus beta tilde w is equal to mu tilde transpose 0 plus beta tilde f star. That's the equation of the hyperplane. And the fact that A is in the positive half space just means that if I pick a point z comma w in A, then you will have an inequality in between. So A in positive half space implies that mu tilde transpose z plus beta tilde w is greater than or equal to beta tilde f star for all z w in A. Oh, because it's a scalar, right? takes a scalar value, takes a vector value. Okay. Yes. And because of how the problem is 
constructed, and we're never going to vary away from um, beta being a scalar, which is why for our claim five, scalar multiplication yes. Yes. constant to get yes. constant. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, any question on this? Supporting hyperplane theorem? No? Okay, so let's move on to claim four. So, I know that z comma w is in A. This implies that z plus uh, <coughs> ei comma w also lies in A. So, and c comma w plus 1 also lies in A. I is equal to zero 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 one zero zero zero, where one is at the ith position. Okay. Maybe. Z to be anything, uh, let's say Z equals 0, and W equals uh, F star. I have beta tilde F star is less than or equal to beta tilde F star plus 1. which implies that beta tilde is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So as long as you are moving in this direction, so pick any point z comma w, as long as I move in this direction or move in this direction, I know that I'm going to remain within the set A. Okay, and writing here that beta tilde is greater than or equal to zero, and a similar proof, similarly, mu tilde is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. This is also fairly straightforward. So it's similar for each specific uh, each, each specific I. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. That's exactly the case. Okay, any question on the fourth proof? No? First part of the proof, which is mu tilde is non negative, beta tilde is non negative. We still need to show that beta tilde is strictly positive. Then this operation is well defined. Okay. So let's move on to proof five. Any question so far? No. Proof five. Oh, not five, actually. Second part of four. So now, assume beta is equal to 0. So this is again proof by contradiction. So I'm going to assume that beta is equal to 0. Then I have mu transpose z is greater than or equal to 0 for all z in, for all z comma w in A. So this implies that summation mu i or mu j gj x bar j equals 1 to r 
is greater than or equal to 0 for all, no, not for all, but just for specific x bar. So that's the Slater constraint. Okay, so this comes from assuming that beta tilde is equal to zero. Should be beta tilde mu tilde. So, if I assume that beta tilde is equal to zero, so this term is already zero. This term drops out, is equal to zero. This term is equal to zero. So all I am left with is mu tilde transpose z, which is non-negative. Okay, now I know that this there is a point x bar such that this condition holds. So therefore, uh, I can just take this z to be g j g one x bar, g two x bar, g three x bar, and so on. Strictly, but then the sum. So this is non-negative, and this is strictly negative. How can the sum be greater than or equal to zero? When would the sum be greater than or equal to zero? So this is non-negative, and this is strictly negative. When mu equals zero, mu equals zero. Okay. So only if all of these are simultaneously zero, then my g j x bar. So this is strictly negative. So I have zero multiplied by negative. I add it up. I get zero. So then this condition is satisfied. So mu equals to zero is the only deduction we can make from this expression. Now I have beta tilde equal to zero, mu tilde equal to zero. But remember that the supporting hyperplane theorem says that both of them cannot be all zero. Okay, so mu cannot be so yeah, so they they can, so at least one of them have to be not so contradiction. This implies that beta tilde must be strictly positive. Yes? What is the contradiction um, Make it so uh, we don't wind up saying mu tilde is greater than equal to zero and not the constraint on the So let's say, uh, so from here, so I, must, so I want to show that tilde is strictly greater than zero. Yeah. Okay, so I can only have a contradiction when I assume that this holds, and then negative of this holds, so negation of this holds, so that's beta tilde equal to zero, because it cannot be less than zero. Mm -hmm. And then I conclude that there is a contradiction. I mean, not conclude, but that leads to a contradiction. Okay. Okay. Is equal to zero, and then I follow the steps, and I get mu tilde equal to zero, but that's contradicting supporting hyperplane theorem. So beta tilde must be positive. OK, any other? OK. So now get to the claim 5. So I'm going to define mu equals to mu tilde over beta tilde. And this is also greater than or equal to 0. Because the numerator is non-negative, the denominator is strictly positive, so it doesn't change the thing. So what I have is f uh, mu transpose gx. So this is for all points uh, in the set capital X. So mu transpose gx plus fx is greater than or equal to mu transpose 0 plus f star comes from this expression. f star is less than or equal to L of x comma mu. which implies that f star is less than or equal to inf over all x in x l of x comma mu
uh, time is up. Okay, so time is up, but you know how to fill in the blanks, right? Then f star is less than or equal to inf x in x, which is equal to q mu, which is less than or equal to q star, so there is no duality gap. So anyways, uh, we'll talk about branch and bound algorithm, and then we'll move on to dynamic optimization problem, which is, you know, this uh, next one month, we will just talk about dynamic uh, optimization. So.